And the question is, can we find these elements? Because each of these elements is basically shaped by the gravitational forces um, in the, uh, that basically shape the cosmic web. Now, we know since uh, the work of the Soviet school in the 70s, and particularly materialized in the uh, paper by Bond, Kaufman, and Pogosian in 96, that when we look at the cosmic web, like we see over here, it is basically shaped by the tidal forces. Uh, the bars in green that you see over here are basically the bars of the compressional tidal forces, that is, the forces that compress uh, the matter in a certain direction. And you see that the filaments are really showing up strongly in this whole network. And of course, the ones that are most outstanding are the, uh, are, are the clusters. And the clusters basically are the main agents of this whole tidal force field. They are the ones that evoke all this. But by evoking this tidal field, they basically put filamentary bridges in between. And uh, if you would look very well, you see that so now and then there are membranes or sheets in between. At the same time, when you would zoom in onto scales of galactic halos and galaxies inside them, that is when you would zoom in over here, you of course are dealing with the same tidal forces. Well, we know that galaxies and halos start to rotate and they basically shape themselves and the same forces are involved. So you would expect naturally that they start to align themselves along these structures. Now, you may wonder, when do I form a filament? What does that mean about the tidal force configuration? When do I, uh, and what happens to the galaxies that are inside them and the halos that are inside them? The same for the sheets. You would expect that the sheets form when only the structure starts <laughs> to collapse in only one direction, while the filaments form when it collapses in two directions. Do you see the result on the halos that are contained in them? And would you see any differences? I will show you later on that indeed you do see differences. Um, well, I told you basically the story about the cosmic web theory in the tidal field, so let's go beyond that. Here you see what basically happens when you have a certain in initial conditions and tidal force configuration, and of course in the end you end up with a bridge like that. That's basically the whole story. Now, so we want to understand how these galaxies start to spin up, and uh, we, the most viable theory at the moment is that indeed it is the tidal forces, and the tidal forces basically start to talk the collapsing halo because the tidal force that is working on them, and uh, while it is working, the whole thing starts to talk and rotate and you basically get a rotating galaxy and a prediction for the angular momentum that is basically uh, formed by the tidal force and the inertia tensor of the collapsing halo. Now, this, of course, is the picture that comes out of the pure linear theory, and you can basically do the calculations. But there are all kinds of nonlinear effects that may either augment or uh, um, basically work on the collapsing of this form and basically ends the story in between the tidal force and the sort of get predictions about what may be going on and you can parameterize it, how strong this coupling is. To look into this is basically look, um, look into um, either simulations or and relate this to observations. Now, one of the main problems when analyzing simulations is how do I find the filaments, how do I find the sheets, and how can I basically trace the halos or the galaxies inside them? That's a far from trivial procedure. Usually, it's not done like that, and it's, it's very hard. The filament, to define a filament, is far from trivial because it's an extended structure. It's not very um, uh, concentrated, so uh, how to define this? Now to define this, you can basically define some machinery, but for that you need to go and look around where to find this machinery. We basically looked in the field of computational geometry and in the field of medical visualization and came up with a basically a machinery that allows you to identify not only 
the outstanding clusters, but also the filamentary bridges or the membranes, etc. Let me describe to you shortly how this goes. Well, here you basically see already the density field that corresponds to a large and body simulation of cosmic structure formation. What it starts with is, of course, usually you only have a discrete distribution that is tracing this uh, matter distribution. Either it's n body particles or they are galaxies. Right? Now you have to translate this into a density field. And of this density field, you basically want to determine the morphology. Right? And the morphology determines whether you're dealing with filamentary bridges with walls. Once you've done that, translated into a density field, you can use that information of the density field to do all kinds of things. You could, for example, easily pick out the peaks in the density distribution. But what do you do in case you have filaments or walls? With the added complication that you're not dealing with structures of one particular scale, but when you would zoom in on different scales, you see the hierarchical structure of this. Large filaments exist of smaller and smaller filaments. So you have to do something. Now, forming the density field just by smoothing out the particle distribution with some arbitrary filter is not serving you very well because you're basically destroying the information that you have. In particular, when you would look, uh, use, for example, spherical filters, you would destroy filaments and sheets immediately. <coughs> so you need to come up with something that does it naturally. Well, the natural thing to do, let me first walk a little bit further and then go back. I see that I did the order wrong is by going to this structure. What you see over here is tessellations. Each of these blocks is basically that part of space that is closer to the particular galaxy or particle and body particle than any other particle of space. When you use this structure, you can use basically the adaptive nature of this construct to determine both the density as well as the geometry of the underlying matter distribution. When you do that, and this is a machinery that's called DTFE, you basically get this structure that you see over here. This is the n-body particle simulation density field. And we, when you would zoom in, you see it over there. That's the same structure. You see one thing. The bridges are really found without any problem. If you're also interested in the uh, velocity distribution, we're not here, you see this immediately returning to. So this is basically our image how of is, the universe. How is that image above, above and left, is that, how is that related to the tessellation? Um, so what you see in here is the image is basically the intensity. And the intensity is basically the inverse of the cells, of the tessellation cells. Okay. Then. The, that's determined, the density is determined at each of the points of your sample and subsequently interpolated on what's called the Deloney grid. And it turns out that all this stuff is not only feeling the density but also the geometry. So that's why you get all these bridges. You see that nothing is smoothed out in this direction. It basically starts to follow it like this. Um, this procedure, by the way, the interpolation procedure, seems to be one of the most, computer, uh, most intensive uses of computer power in the world, according to the latest numerical recipes, because this is what's used in all the games. The interpolation on the Deloney grids is one of the things that's underlying a lot of the 3D uh, graphics in uh, computer games. So now, to do the tessellation, you have to, there is one parameter, the number of neighbors. No, yeah. it's not. The, uh, once you have the points, you immediately have the tessellation. It's okay. one definition. So you take the points, and you ask yourself which part of space is closer to that point than any of the other points. That's all. It's the nearest neighbor. It's not the nearest neighbor. It's a natural neighbor. That's the difference. It's, it's not the nearest neighbor. And, uh, but I, we, I can tell you later what the specific difference is. It's, it is very essential, but that's not it. Now, 
I only wanted to mention this here because this provides us with the density field that we need to trace the filaments. But we're not there yet. We now have the image that we need. Now, in medical research, often the question is, posed with a particular image, for example, of your insight, some picture, some medical image, um, doctors often want to know for example, how your veins are doing or your blood vessels are doing, or whether, for example, there is a dangerous lump over there. So how do you detect these in an objective manner? They have a machinery that's called uh, scale space analysis, where actually they take the image and smooth it over a whole range of scales. And subsequently, they have a filter bank <coughs> tuned towards finding particular structures. For example, you're interested in finding a lump, and then you're going to determine, on the basis of the eigenvalues of the density field, where the three eigen eigenvectors are pointing inside, because that determines that you have a lump. Then, over the range of scales, you start to look where you have the strongest signal, and you pick out, and you say, hey, there's a lump, and it has this size. The same thing you could do with your veins or your blood vessels. You could smooth it over a range of scales and look where the two eigenvalues of the density field are pointing inside, and the other one is basically stretching it. That would be a filament. Now, if you do that over a range of scales, you can, for example, find, well, there's a very strong vessel or a very strong blood vessel, something like your aorta. Or when you look at a much finer level, you find a much finer level. Now, it's exactly this construct, this procedure, scale space analysis, that we use in our analysis of the cosmic web. Only we don't have a nice X-ray image like this in medical research, and we certainly don't have the high contrast. But we could use this DTFV field because this DTFV field that I showed you with all the filaments and walls still contains all the information that was in the galaxy distribution and do the same scale space analysis as you see over here and this is the fine scale that is the highly smooth scale and we basically pr uh, process it through the same filter bank and when we do that we end up with this image and then finally this is the filter bank, and here, this was the filter bank basically for the filaments. You end up with this image for the various components of an embody simulation. So here you see the filaments. Here you see the sheets. You see there is nothing like a massive sheet. They basically curved structures like that, and their density contrast is not very high. These would be the clusters. So now we have basically dissected the embodied simulation in the various components. And we can, for example, turn towards the filaments and ask ourselves, so what about the halos inside those things? Here you see an image of the various halos grouped along the filamentary network. Here you see the clusters. And you can basically proceed. Here you can basically class classify the various filaments that you have in your sample. And here's another one. This is a very massive, very highly dense filament, which you usually find in between two very massive clusters, as is predicted by cosmic web theory. This is a much more chaotic one, and this is almost like a sheet in the galaxy distribution. And you can then proceed to basically address the question, can I learn something about the alignments of the halos? Yes? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, a it's a slight complication I didn't mention here. The real halos are the gray ones, but on top of that we have a compression procedure that basically along the ridge of the filaments compresses them into these black ones so we can easier pick them out, right? And those, so, are, those are halos you find, or just Yeah, this is halos, right. This is an embodied simulation, still an embodied simulation. So you ran some halo finder? Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. So we basically have an embodied simulation. We have the halo finder, and then we have the halos, and we ask, am I in this filament or this filament or in that filament? Uh, Lev? Um, it, it is related, but it doesn't give the, right, uh, the same answer. There are notable differences, yes. But it surely is related, and there is some measure of percolation involved in the procedure at some level. Not exactly. Okay, so now we have those halos. We may ask, for example... Okay, what happens to these halos as they evolve in the cosmic web? Well, you know, they start building up, merging, stuff is falling in. Uh, originally, most of the matter distribution is rather randomly distributed around them, but as the, ever, the matter distribution evolves, you see the collapse of the halo of the filaments around them. And you, for example, when you would look at the sky of such a halo, you start, for example, to see here towards the la latest moment that the matter is only coming in from the sides of the filaments, as you would expect, right? So you can follow basically the evolution of these halos. When they are either in a filament or in this one, you see that they, they are basically lying in a sheet. So you can basically distinguish between them. Now, you may ask yourself, okay, um, let's first have a look at the shape of the halos and then later distinguish, uh, look, look uh, differently at the, uh, uh, the spin. Well, it turns out that on average, the halos in the filaments are elongated along the filament. It is actually, but it is an average effect. So the spread around it is enormous, but when you would sort of take the average, you would see that the halos in the filaments are basically aligning along the filament. That is, their major axis is lying along the filament. The halos in the walls have the same, um, have the, have the same behavior. They are also lying within the wall. Right? Now, the orientation in the beginning was a lot stronger than it was towards the end. Nonlinear effects are basically destroying the alignment more and more. So you expect a much stronger alignment at higher redshifts. Right? Then you can ask yourself, turn towards, for example, the angular momentum of the halos, and ask yourself, do I see differences over there? First of all, you could ask yourself, do I see a difference in the spin itself, the spin amplitude? That's marginal. There is hardly an effect. Here on the high spin end, you do see some differences between the filaments and the sheets, but not a lot. And actually, it depends quite a lot on the specific halo and subhalo finder that you use. So you cannot make any strong conclusions with respect to differences in the distribution of the spin amplitude. But in the spin alignment, there certainly seems to be an interesting difference. Here you see the two graphs for the spin alignment. This is basically aligned. This is non-aligned for both the halos in the filaments and the sheets. And you see there is a difference in mass in the case of the filaments, while in the case of the sheets, it's all the same. Is, it, is the angle there... Orientation with the sheet? No, so here, here, this uh, is the answer. So the filaments, in the filaments, you see that the average spin direction of the high mass halos is perpendicular to the filament, while the low mass halos did start perpendicular, but as they evolve, the spin starts to basically align along the filament. In the walls, you don't see that. They are always aligned along the wall. Again, this is basically this is an average effect. It is not a systematic effect that's always. It's only when you start to average out. This is basically what starts to happen. Right? Um, so this is basically the picture with respect to the spin alignments. Now, I should basically round it off. I see I don't have time anymore to go into the voids because they are 
actually, in a sense, more interesting, but I should conclude with basically taking this up and go towards an observational sample. And this is an sample of galaxies in the DR5 of the Sloan survey, which were basically processed through the same machinery. So we basically ordered them, whether they were in sheets, in filaments, or in clusters. And subsequently, we selected out, just crudely, the ones that are edge-on. Because when they're edge-on, we basically can easily determine their direction uh, with respect to the surrounding filaments. Subsequently, we started to re uh, relate or their angle with respect to the filaments in which they were lying in order to see whether indeed there is a trace of alignments. As you know, there are various claims. Either there are no alignments or there are alignments. Now, according to these simulations, you would expect an effect. Is this real? Now, this turns out to be a really cumbersome affair. And we basically had to go down to the um, game of basically like you see over here, taking each galaxy and the surrounding filamentary structures and start to study the 3D uh, structure to see whether they, we see anything uh, that is worthwhile investigating. So as you see over here are some of the images. Once we did that, we put it in a, and basically selected out the right ones and started to, do, to look at it in the machinery. And this is basically what you get. This means it's perpendicular with the filaments. This is, means it's basically aligned along the filaments. So would this mean that there is some effects? Actually, it is rather disappointing because if you look well at the geometry of the um, situation, of the configuration, it turns out that when they would be randomly distributed, that you would expect this. So there is no effect over there. We are basically set with some 15 galaxies, and we know exactly which ones they are, that end up over here. And the question we have is, does this mean that some of the galaxies are really oriented perpendicular to the um, filaments or not? It is a marginal effect. It doesn't seem to be very strong, but it <laughs> might be significant. Uh, at the moment, we are basically looking into DR6 and taking a larger example, not only the edge on, but the conclusion carefully at the moment is there may be an intrinsic alignment, but if it's there, it's not very strong. So I should conclude over there. Thank you for your attention. Yes, that's exactly what we are doing. But for the first time, we wanted to be sure to have a sample as clean as possible so that we would understand every selection effect. It would not be bothered by you know, whether, what exactly the morphology of the galaxy itself is or um, whether we had the orientation right. Well, so I, it, would seem, it would seem like that's uh, why I do, you've done a three-dimensional test side of data. But for statistical effect, you could do it in two dimensions. And Um, that you could do if you would understand exactly how the filaments are behaving with respect to the line of sight. And you, you know, it's a 3D, non-trivial geometric structure. And you would then also have to start that to, to take into account. And although you, it's possible to do that, we, for the moment we didn't want to. Right? It, it, it is a next step that you want to do. But the first thing was, do we find something? And this was as clean as we could do it. You mean the, uh, the alignment of the yeah. uh, clusters? What I understand of, um, well, for example, Manolis Plionis has been doing a lot of work into this. 
And that seems to be very strong. Um, now, the interesting question, as you know yourself, would be not just to look whether there is this alignment, but does it depend on distance? Does it depend on the mutual orientation of the clusters? And all this kind of stuff. As far as I know, there is no such study um, completed. Um, but, you know, we ourselves have basically embarked upon something like that because that would be one of the most interesting tests for the cosmic web theory, as you're well aware. No, so uh, what do you mean with the sign of the, the pixel? It's basically the particle of the galaxy. In the density field, so you start with uh, the discrete position for the object. Yes. And you end up with the density field. So in the process, you use oscillation, which yeah. um, has a various shape of pixel. So I don't know, I don't know how it works exactly. Oh, oh. Okay, no, so the, the images I showed is of course just a pixel map, but it's just for showing it. It's for, um, you, you know, to show the image. But basically the tessellation field, the dense DTEP density field, is defined at every location within that volume. If you give me some arbitrary position, I can give you the value of the density and the velocity. It does not depend on any pixel uh, location or whatever. Are there any other questions? Let's uh, break for coffee.